Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We start this session on time. First of all, I would like to say that thank you very much for attending APSC JCS webinar number four. This is a live web session. I am Takanori Keda from Toho University, Tokyo, one of the chairperson of this session. And the co chairperson is uh, Dr. Chin Chi Keong from National Health Center, Singapore. Before this session, I would like to briefly have the introduction of this webinar. The APSC is one of the key regional cardiology association aiming to facilitate the communication, collaboration, and professional development for the advancement of scientific and medical practice in cardiovascular disease in Asia Pacific region. This time, together with JCS, we are holding a webinar which is entitled New Horizon in Arisumia. We certainly hope would be an equally meaningful scientific exchange and interaction. In this webinar, we invited four speakers focusing on catheter ablation to eliminate atrial fibrillation, including current topics such as indication, techniques, and specific cases, and also leadless pacemaker and subcutaneous devices including update topics. I will chair first and the second talks, and Dr. Keon will chair third and the fourth talks. Let's get started this session. If the audience have a question, please click the Q and A button in the bottom of the screen. Let's move on to the second topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yamane. So second speaker is uh, Dr. Yoshihide Takahashi from Tokyo Medical and uh, Dental University, Tokyo. His talk title is uh, AF Abrasion in Congestive Heart Failure, Who, When, and How. Could you start your presentation, Dr. Takahashi? Thank you, uh, Dr. Ikeda. Firstly, I'd like to uh, thank our uh, organizing committee for inviting me this uh, webinar. So I'd like to overview the uh, AFib population in heart failure patients. So let me start from this uh, landmark study uh, from a Bordeaux group, uh, published in uh, 16 years ago already. So this uh, single center uh, observational study look at the changes in LV ejection fraction after AFib ablation. So mean LV ejection fraction was 35% at, before the ablation but uh, one month later, after ablation, LVF increased to 50%. And then up to six months, LVF increased slightly. And beyond six months, LVF did not increase, but did not decrease either. So you, you may think uh, rate control before ablation was poor in most of patients, but actually half of patients had bad rate control, but in, in the remaining half, remaining half patients, rate control was uh, adequate. And a patient with uh, inadequate rate control, LVF changed significantly from 35 to 55%, but also in the patients with the uh, adequate rate control, the ejection fraction increased up to 50%. So before this study, we, we called the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. But after this study, we said AFib induced cardiomyopathy. So not all uh, patients with uh, heart failure uh, reduced LV ejection fraction with AFib. Uh, rate control alone is not enough to improve uh, heart rate. But in the same year, this study from uh, Cleveland Clinic, they also demo uh, look at uh, changes in LV ejection fraction after AFib ablation. So before ablation, 36%, but after ablation, uh, 41%. LV increased, 
but only by 5% and statistically not significant. Both studies are uh, observational studies, single center, and uh, the results are quite different. So at that time, we did, we did, we did not know why uh, clinical uh, increase in uh, LVEF differed according to uh, study. And 10 years later, this is, I think, a first study to uh, to uh, first first randomized clinical trial. So patients were uh, randomized to ablation and uh, medical medical uh, therapy. And this is a LV ejection fraction. Ablation group LVF changed from thirty two percent to forty two percent. And the medical treatment, LBF did not change, but slightly decreased. So between two groups, there is a statistical significance. But again, increase in LBF was not as big as a Bodo paper, about 10% increase. And a recent paper from uh, Australia, they, they also performed a randomized clinical trial so patients, uh, persistent AP patients, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, so they excluded uh, valvular heart disease or ischemic cardiomyopathy. And the patients were randomized to ablation or rate control. And the ablation group had a significant increase in uh, LVEF by 18%, similar to a Bordeaux paper. Of course, uh, uh, between two groups, there's significant, uh, statistical significance, but they also perform the MRI. And uh, uh, late gadolinium enhancement, if patients had left uh, LGE, ventricular LGE, LVEF was smaller than the patients without LGE. And this figure shows a, a very, uh, very nice uh, relationship between LG and uh, changes in LVF with uh, increase in the uh, ventricle LG, increase in LVF decrease, uh, inverse relationship between LG and uh, LVF changes. So if you perform uh, MRI before ablation, we can predict changes in LVF. So ventricular fibrosis is uh, one reason why some patients increase, uh, does not increase LVF. So uh, this is of course very, uh, very well uh, known, uh, famous uh, study, Castle AF. Proximal AFib, persistent AFib, NYJ class two, three, four patients, and LVG ejection fraction less than 35%. And all patients had defibrillator. And this is the primary uh, outcome of this study. So death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure. So ablation was superior to medical therapy. Hazard ratio was 0.42. So our primary endpoint reduced by 40, uh, 38% in ablation group. But please look at carefully this figure. So, at the first six months, blue and red curve was exactly on the same. And then a red curve dropped a bit, but up to 24 months, difference was not that big. But beyond two, two, two years, red curve dropped down. And finally, hazard ratio was 0.62. This is a, a couple of mere curve of uh, all cause death. So also this figure up to three years, two curves are almost the same, but beyond three years, medical therapy patient had a, a, a more often die. So one of the most important findings of this study was uh, when we treat a patient with heart failure and AFib, ablation improves uh, survival, 
or a host, a reduced hospitalization, but this event will occur three or four or five years later, very long, long after, after, uh, after we uh, select a, a treatment option. So when we think of uh, a treatment option, we have to think of a long-term outcome of that patient. Sometimes the patient looks very healthy, but patient, uh, this patient will die in you know, five years later. And another important uh, findings of this study is this subgroup analysis. Yes. So NYHA class two patient hazard ratio was 0.42. So ablation was very, very good, very, uh, very good. But uh, NYHA class three patients hazard ratio was 0.89. And uh, so ablation, medical therapy, almost the same. And uh, P4 interaction is 0.06. LV ejection fraction greater than 25%, hazard ratio 0.48, so ablation is uh, good. But uh, LVF less than 25%, hazard ratio was over one, 1.36. So uh, medical therapy was a bit better. So if the patients, so this means that the patients are so sick, ablation will not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not good as, uh, uh, not good. So NYHA class three or LBF less than 25%, maybe medical therapy is an option. And then this uh, study is uh, uh, published in the last year, the end of the last year. Amica, Amica trial. So this figure is uh, uh, shows the AFI burden after uh, during the follow up. This is the ablation group. So dark green shows an, uh, if, uh, no AFI burden after ablation, and uh, light green shows an uh, AFI burden less than 5%. So ablation group, 72% of patients had less than 5% of AFI burden. Medical group, 44%. So in terms of uh, uh, rhythm control, ablation was superior to medical therapy. But if you look at LBF, every ejection fraction was similar between two groups. So this, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the results of this study were, uh, were different from uh, previous studies. The, this is probably because they included too many sick patients. So NYH class, three patients, 59%, mean LBF was 26%. So if you remember the subgroup analysis of from um, Castle AF, NYHA class three and LBF less than 25%. Half of patients had a, a very uh, sick patients. This ATAC trial, uh, they, uh, this is also a randomized clinical trial. The end point was, uh, the, uh, the end point of this study was freedom from AFib after, uh, after randomization. Patients were randomized to ablation or amiodarone. And uh, ablation was uh, better than amiodarone. And in this study, they also uh, assessed changes in LV ejection fraction and the six minutes walk distance and quality of life. And the patients without any recurrences, LVF changes in LVF, six minutes walk distance, uh, distance and the quality of life. These changes were greater than patients with uh, without recurrence. So no recurrence patients were better than a recurrence. So of course, heart failure patients, it's better to maintain sinus rate and ablation is better than a drug therapy. However, this ATAC trial demonstrated Predictors of AFib recurrence was LVF. So LVF was low 
is uh, lower, ablation success get will also get lower. And this another study. This study also shows that heart failure patient had a lower rate of uh, lower rate of uh, uh, freedom from AFib. Why patients with uh, low e low LV ejection fraction had a, a recurrences? That's because a, um, heart failure patients have extensive atrial scarring, not ventricular atrial scarring. So this study show uh, looking at uh, by atrial voltage areas. Upper panel shows that the heart is from uh, patients with heart failure. A lot of a lot of uh, low voltage in the left atrium and also in the right atrium. So this atrial substrate prevent uh, maintain sinus only by PB isolation. So uh, this uh, this slide shows that the ablation strategy used in the previous uh, randomized trials. Come to trial, they did a PBI isolation, cafe ablation, and linear ablation. So, stepwise ablation approach, very uh, aggressive, extensive ablation lesions. ATAC trial, PBI isolation, and uh, posterior wall isolation. Actually, this group did uh, not isolation, debulking of the left atrial posterior, uh, posterior wall, a very large uh, lesion set, and SVC isolation. But the more recent study, uh, PBI only is at 49%, 51%, Castle AF Amica trial. But the half of patients had additional lesions. So these uh, previous studies demonstrate the superiority of uh, ablation therapy over medical treatment, probably because many patients were in sinus rhythm after ablation. But most of patients had it not only PBI, very extensive ablation, probably extensive ablation was effective because uh, a lot of patients had extensive atrial uh, scarring. So the problem of uh, AFib ablation in heart failure patients is we don't know optimal ablation strategy for that high risk patient. If we can, I, can, if we can find uh, optimal ablation strategy, maybe we can improve uh, clinical outcomes of heart failure patients with uh, uh, NYHA class three. So let me summarize that today's talk. So firstly, patient section. So LVF less uh, greater than twenty five percent NYHA class two. This patient may benefit from ablation compared to medical therapy. And of course, we, may, we it's, it's necessary to maintain sinus rhythm after ablation, but long term the persistent AFib, efficacy of ablation is lower. So of course, pers uh, these patients were not a good indication and not good candidates for ablation. So timing of ablation as early as possible if you wait uh, ablation, they get uh, more atrial substrate. But in so, some patients are very sick. So some, uh, we often perform uh, electrical cardioversion during uh, hospitalization for heart failure and wait for one or two months if we sinus can maintain. And we wait for uh, patient uh, recovered during that period that's uh, uh, safer for patients. But uh, if uh, sinus wound cannot be maintained, uh, probably uh, we need ablation earlier. And the problem is ablation strategy. So PBI is a cornerstone. So for this, uh, uh, we, uh, no, nobody argued this, uh, this but uh, Definitely, some patients we need uh, uh, something, uh, something uh, ablation strategy, uh, adjunctive to PBI isolation. 
So if we can find another uh, new ablation strategy, uh, we can uh, uh, expand uh, pa patient selection. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. We have uh, time for discussion. So now we got uh, one question from the audience. Okay, Dr. Takashi, the yes. question is that after successful aberration of AF, when LVEF was improved, in case of no AF recurrence, can we stop anti heart failure agent such as beta blocker? That's a question. Thank you for all the question. So mm -hmm. that's a uh, yeah, important point. So uh, as I showed today, so some patients uh, one month later, LVF jumped up to 50%, but uh, some patients didn't require uh, longer. So, uh, but, uh, so that's why I, I monitor uh, BNP and um, my clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, if BNP uh, dropped down, I stopped, uh, firstly, I stopped uh, diuretics, diuretics. But I, stay, I, I keep uh, uh, prescribing a beta blocker because some patients have uh, re recurrences and uh, some patients will back with uh, not AFib, atrial flutter. In, th in that case, uh, rate control was more difficult compared mm -hmm. to uh, AFib. So I think it's better to keep a beta blocker uh, mm -hmm. at least six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we got another question from our audience. The question is that after operation of AF and no recurrence, can we, use, can we stop anticoagulation therapy? Yeah. Uh, That's a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a very important uh, issue, but uh, we, don't have, we don't have enough uh, data to support this, uh, uh, support this continuation of anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. Actually, I continue as long as possible if a patient had heart failure, because uh, this, the patient will be, uh, heart failure will be recovered. Mm -hmm. But if patient had a heart failure recurrence again, some patients will go back to heart failure very easy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if a heart failure, uh, if the patient has a heart failure again, mm -hmm. the child's score is uh, at least two. So the, mm -hmm. uh, the patient is re uh, definitely required anticoagulation. So I think it's better to continue. Okay. So I have one question. Yep. As you mentioned, in a patient with AF and heart failure, with heart failure, HF reduce EF, HF, right. calcium ablation improve the LV EF. Yes. So I think this good result achieved mainly in patient with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So my question is that when we targeted ischemic cardiomyopathy, whether the improvement of LVEF will be obtained or not, because the ischemic heart disease is the most frequent cause of heart failure. Thank you. So. Uh... So in uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, probably uh, they will not have an increase in uh, LVEF like uh, uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy. But uh, there, there is no uh, randomized trial. But uh, from my experience, mm -hmm. this patient will go down mm -hmm. uh, one year, two, 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 three years later in terms of LVEF or uh, heart failure stage or sometimes more, um, more mm -hmm. nothing. So that's why I think it's better to uh, keep the patient in sinus rhythm. Okay, so mm -hmm. your idea is that that is also effective. Okay, thank yes. you very much. And the last question, are there any significant data with respect to a patient with HFPF preserved EF caused by a hypertrophic heart? Are there any data so far? Yes, uh, there are some, uh, I think not only one, several uh, 
studies, uh, there are several studies, and uh, all studies uh, demonstrated a superiority of uh, ablation therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So, Dr. Keo, please go ahead. Sado and the fourth one. All right, thank you very much. I really enjoy your talk, uh -huh. especially your summary slide on who to, which, which patient to, you know, refer for an early ablation. We will now switch gear to devices, and we have uh, Dr. Chi Yu from the Division of Cardiology, Department of Internal Medicine at National Taiwan University Hospital, Taiwan. She will talk to us on leadless and subcutaneous devices, updates, and patient selection. Dr. Yu, please. Okay. Um... So good evening, gen um, ladies and gentlemen. It's really my honor to have this talk with you. Um, so um, I have nothing to disclose. So in the very beginning, I like to mention again, though I, I believe you, you all know that why do we need lidless lit and subcutaneous device? Um, actually, the issue is actually is two parts. One is intravascular, one is lead. So the first thing is the durability. If um, you probably recall that um, earlier the Rieta lead, that um, with time went by the um, insulation break, causing many um, inappropriate uh, shock. And the other thing is the intravascular lead may cause adhesion um, causing structure distortion or vessel obstruction, including the central vein and tricuspid valves. Also, the, the um, lumen in the, uh, the lead, uh, the dead space in the central lumen would prone to uncontrolled infection. So actually it is safer to be away from intravascular system. So what we have on the horizon, um, this is uh, what I will cover in this talk, including Lilith pacemaker, which has no intravascular lead and no subcutaneous generator. And I will cover subcutaneous ICD, which has no intravascular lead, but has subcutaneous lead and generator. And I will also mention uh, two uh, small devices, which um, is not really very new, but is uh, or um, still under evaluation. So first of all, the Lilith pacemaker. On the left-hand side is the um, electronic micro. And um, it is um, probably the only Lilith pacemaker on the market. On the right-hand side is the um, centromedical nano steam, uh, which is uh, because of some problem is still under investigation. The MICRA has been approved by FTA in 2016. And uh, for the past years, the uh, implementation procedures has in increased a lot. And the micro AV has been uh, approved by FDA in the beginning of this year. Uh, we will talk about it later. So, um, um, in 2016, there is um, a very good clinical trial um, show on um, um, single arm uh, observing the micro procedure success. Um, the acute implantation success rate is a 99. Oh, sorry, is not is 99 percent, and the procedure time is only 28 minutes. Uh, so the procedure is quite safe and and with the follow up, we can see uh, the complication rate, the safety issue, the complication rate reduced almost 50%. Mainly, um, there's no pocket infection because there's no pocket. There's no lead dislodgement because there's no intravascular lead. For the long term efficacy. You can see the, uh, uh, the pacing threshold is quite stable and the predicted um, battery longevity is more than 12 years. So uh, the micro um, is uh, very uh, good 
And for the past four years, there has been there there have been many um, um, observations in many different subgroups. For example, in the very elderly patient, in patient with cardio inhibitory vessel vagal syncope, uh, in patient with cardiac transplant recipient, or in patient with bioprosthetic and repair chest cuspid valves. So the safety and efficacy of micro has been um, proved uh, many times in different uh, fragile subgroups. But um, when we considering when we consider implanting this uh, device, we still need to know that um, only VVIR mode is available. Therefore, the, the device is limited to patient with chronic atrial fibrillation with a very rare need for pacing or very frail older adults. If we um, look back the meta-analysis comparing atrial-based pacing or ventricular-based pacing, we, we can know that with ventricular-based pacing like the micro VVI mode, the all-cause mortality or the stroke rate is actually higher than atrial-based pacing. That is what we should pay attention to. And besides, um, you can see on the left-hand left, left -hand side figure, um, the, the risk, um, the heart failure hospitalization rate actually increased from very beginning proportional to the RV pacing percentage. So, um, we should pay attention to only RV pacing. So we've been waiting for DDD uh, Lilith pacemaker, but actually in this year, uh, FDA approved the first model of micro AV, the VDD mode. It is based on Marvel 2 study. It is an uh, downloadable algorithm. This is uh, called Marvel 2 algorithm. Um, it has the uh, enhanced accelerometer filtering automatic threshold adjustment and mode switch between VVI 50 and VDD mode. Uh, as you can see the figure here, um, you can see it. Um, there are three time window. One is um, postventricular atrial blanking a3 and A4 with different sensing threshold. So this would enhance the atrial kicking detection. In this study, um, uh, there are, um, they main, mainly include patients with normal sinus rhythm with complete AV block. Um, there are 40 patients in this study. It is a prospective uh, multi-center clinical trial. In this, um, um, in this figure, we can see the patient's AV synchronous percentage increased from 26.8% in VVI50 mode, and it increased to 89% when it changed to VDD mode. The increase of AV synchronous is very significant. And the AV synchronous percentage can change when uh, with different maneuver. Um, it like at resting status, the AV synchronous can achieve 90%. But when the patient like sitting and standing up, the um, AV synchronous drops slightly to 70%. And with time went by, the AV synchrony percentage dropped slightly, but still it is above 80%. There are two surrogate uh, showing the good, good, um, good way of uh, this VDD. For the first one is LVOT, Velocity Time Index. It is um, a, pro, uh, a surrogate of left ventricular stroke volume. As you can see, with VVI to VDD mode, the VTI increased 
um, eight eight point eight percent. So it um, implies that the stroke volume is increased with VDD mode. Another uh, another marker to see this is the sinus rate. When uh, the mode changed from VVI fifty to VDD, um, the sinus rate reduced a little bit. So with these two sure uh, two markers, uh, it represents that the VDD mode of this micro is actually uh, had better score, uh, better performance than VVI fifty. So um, it looks very good, but uh, when we want to really um, implant this micro AV to the patient, we still need to considering um, still need to consider some question. The first the first one is um, the AV synchrony percentage is eighty nine percent. It is very good, but is it good enough? Because um, when we compare it with the traditional transvenous DDD pacemaker, um, the AV synchrony is actually almost 100%. So is 89% good enough? Um, this is what we should think about. And the other thing is the battery drain. Um, because the AV, um, the Marvel 2 study, they use a uh, uh, um, downloadable algorithm into uh, pre-existing pre micro in the patient. So uh, we do not know the battery drain um, in these patients. So this, uh, I, I, ap I apologize that I do not find the uh, related data, but I believe when the micro AV is on the market uh, quickly, we very soon we will know the, the data. So um, FMO is still, a, there's still no atrial pacing. So we, we should still know that this mode is not suitable for a six sign syndrome, um, which is the indication for the majority of the patients. The second device is the cutaneous ICD. Um, this, ICD is actually not a new device. It has been approved in 2012. Um, for the past 10 years, there are a few studies um, showing the efficacy and safety. But um, the most thing that many people concern is the high inappropriate shock rate. So um, in uh, 20s, 16, there are a comparison. It is uh, a head-to-head -head comparison between subcutaneous ICD and transvenous ICD. As you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the transvenous ICD has uh, more, um, I should say, the subcutaneous ICD has less lead complication, but has more non-lead related complications. So after all, the primary uh, endpoint of subcutaneous ICD and transvenous ICD is actually has no significant difference. But if we look, okay, so, so uh, when we are um, considering subcutaneous ICD, uh, we still have to uh, know that there is lack of ventricular pacing it cannot perform anti-tachycardia pacing for monomorphic VT, and it also cannot perform pacing for bradycardia. And because there's no uh, lead in the atrium, so there's no atrial pacing and no atrial arrhythmia differentiation mode. And the third thing is the battery longevity is still a concern because um, nowadays the new uh, the, the newer generation of uh, transvenous ICD can have longevity like 10 years, but the subcutaneous ICD has still uh, shorter battery longevity, like less than six years. Also, the subcutaneous pulse generator is actually larger than uh, traditional ICD. And after all, the cost is quite high compared to transvenous ICD. And 
uh, the reason I want to mention this is there are actually two um, studies presented on HIS uh, this year, uh, a, a late breaking trial session. Um, but um, for these two studies, I can, because their paper has have not published, so I actually could not find the figures, but I can um, report some uh, data from their talk. Well, the first one is Praetorian. Praetorian is actually the first randomized trial of subcutaneous ICD and transvenous ICD. It is conduct a multi-center study. Uh, 80, 849 patients are included. Most of them are ischemic cardiomyopathy. The median ejection fraction was 30%. And most of them are primary prevention. So uh, the most important thing is the patient has to have no need for pacing. And for the median follow-up or four years, um, the subcutaneous ICD is shown to be non-inferior to transvenous device in terms of, of a composite of inappropriate shock and ICD-related complication. Um, but uh, though the composite has no significant difference, but uh, if we look at the detail, the, uh, the, the subcutaneous actually has still, um, the, transvenous, the transvenous arm has uh, more AFib or SVT tachycardia uh, related in upper shock, but subcutaneous ICD has higher uh, cardiac oversensing related in upper shock. For the ICD related complication, the transvenous ICD has higher number of infection while the subcutaneous ICD have more bleeding. Each one has their own issue, but the composite is actually the same. So um, another uh, trial called Untouched. It is not a, um, there's only one arm and observational study. It is a multi-center study, more than 1,000 uh, implantation. The observation is the mean age uh, is 56 and um, most, almost half of them had is ischemic ideology and the LV ejection fraction is 26%. Uh, again, they don't have pacing indication and the follow-up time is uh, 18 months. So uh, with the, uh, the primary endpoint is freedom from inappropriate shock. Um, so actually the inappropriate shock rate is high, very high, it's almost 96%, um, it, it is higher than the cut point 91%, which is um, derived from medit rich trial. So the performance is actually uh, better than the transvenous ICD. And also the an annual inappropriate uh, in shock rate is 31%. And with the latest generation of cutaneous ICD, it can go down to 2.4%. Um, the latest generation has a smart pass filter, uh, which is more smart, is smarter than the old generation in differentiation. Also, the shock success rate is very high. The final, the first shock success rate and the final shock success rate is very high and the overall survival rate is 95%. Uh, one thing I want to mention is um, there was one death that is related to a systole. So in other words, if the patient was implanted with a transvenous ICD, um, actually the uh, systole related deaths can be prevented. So, the concern of the subcutaneous ICD is that uh, um, it's mainly, um, it is mainly in, studied in primary prevention patient. And 
this is easily understood because uh, for secondary prevention patient, most of them need to be paced. Um, so the second thing is we have to make sure the patient doesn't need pacing. And also we may have to make sure the patient doesn't need CRT. Also with a subcutaneous ICD, we still have to uh, consider the shorter longevity and the higher cost. Uh, okay, um, so another two small things that need, um, worth to be mentioned is wireless LV endocardial pacing and substernal pacing. This is the wide CRT system. So there are three components. One is the receiver. Um, so the battery powers the transmitter and the, the transmitter synchronized with RV pacing pulse to transmit ultrasound energy to the receiver electrode. So the receiver electrode can pace the ventricle. This is the wise CRT system. And um, this is the observational study, the select LV study. As you, um, this study, uh, uh, the enrollment of the patient, they need to have failed CRT, which means the CSLE implantation was not feasible or the patient is a CRT non-responder. So among these critical patients, you can see still with this system, the patient's EF can improve uh, with six months and the LV and diastolic volume can reduce at six months. And also on the right-hand side, you can see the, CR, uh, the response rate can go up to 85%, which is very good compared to traditional CRT. Another small thing is the substernal defibrillator with casing, pacing capacity. This is the design of the lead. It has two ring electrode and two high voltage coil. And it is put into from here, substernum to the ritual sternum area. So when it is connected to the patch, we can see the uh, uh, defibrillation rate the success is very high. So um, the, the a good thing of this lead is it can sense the ventricle and it can pace the ventricle. So it can offer anti-tachycardia pacing. Okay, so this is the last slide. So with this figure, we can see there are very many small little things. They are very small in size with this little pacemaker and the wide CRT system and also the subcutaneous ICD. So um, um, eventually they can communicate uh, with each other and they can take care of our heart harmonically. So uh, I believe this is our future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Yu, for your very uh, detailed update on the technology out there. I'm afraid in the interest of time, we have to move on to the next lecture. But for those who are attending, please feel free to type in your questions to the Q&A, and we'll try our best to answer them. Now, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Hong Yulin from Halen University Sacred Heart Hospital from South Korea. He will talk to us on pulmonary vein stenosis <clears throat> problem. Dr. Lin, please. Thank you, Chairman, and hello, colleagues. I'm Dr. Lin from Harlem University Hospital in Korea. Today, I'd like to present the pulmonary vein. PV stenosis or occlusion in single shot ablation technique error. There is no disclosure. If you look at the images before ablation and after ablation, you can clearly see the luminal narrowing in left inferior pulmonary vein here and totally obstructed left inferior pulmonary vein here. We call these PV stenosis or PV occlusion respectively. 
The prevalence of PB sandwiches was as high as 42% in focal or segmental ablation technique within the venous OCL themselves. The incidence of severe PB sandwiches has decreased to between 0.32% and 3.4% with wide area circumferential enteral ablation technique. However, the true incidence of PB sandwiches in the modern ablation era is not well understood because current HRS consensus statement do not recommend routine post-ablation screening for PB sandwiches. Symptomatic patient may come to attention month after their initial AFib ablation procedure. Otherwise, delaying diagnosis has major adverse implications related to progression of the stenosis and severe intraparenchymal lung damage as well. This paper published in circulation in, in circulation 2016 was a prospective observational study of 124 patients with severe PV stenosis evaluated between 2000 and 2014 in Mayo Clinic, United States. 219 PVs were identified as having severe PB stenosis by computed tomography scan. Interestingly, consolidation or ground grace appearance, appearance was only found 25% with chest X-ray and 55% in HLCT. Therefore, chest X-ray or HLCT is not a good imaging modality for diagnosis of PB stenosis. Majority of patients with severe PB stenosis have various symptoms. Of these, more than one third of patients have dyspnea at rest or exertional dyspnea. Almost half of them have cough, fatigue, and discourage exercise tolerance. More than one fourth of patients have hemoptysis. Median time from ablation to symptom onset was four months and median time from onset of symptoms to final PV stenosis diagnosis was 3.3 months. Therefore, PV stenosis should be taken, taken into account when patient to who receiving the AFib ablation have any uh, respiratory symptoms. Majority except 11 patients who have no symptom or refuge pulmonary intervention received balloon angioplasty with or without stent implantation. As you can see, least nauseous rate was 56% in balloon angioplasty group, whereas 27% in stent implantation group, which are still very high than we expected. Mean diameter of balloon or stent was 10 millimeter and mean length of balloon or stent was almost 20 millimeter. Procedural complication rate almost 18%. Majority was bleeding related complication, including hemoptysis, tamponade, pericardial pleural effusion, and pericardial effusion. This logic stent was found in 5% in patients who received stent implantation. This, this is a couple of my covers for least stenosis rate in balloon angioplasty group versus stent implantation group. As you can see, least stenosis rate was significantly higher in balloon angioplasty group compared to the stent implantation group during median follow-up of 4.6 years. PV stenosis is an under-recognized syndrome that can result in significant and debilitating symptoms. Early identification of PV stenosis is crucial, but relies on obtaining appropriate imaging. The symptoms of PV stenosis can be confused for other pulmonary diseases, which can lead to misdiagnosis. Because routine screening for PV stenosis has decreased, maintaining a suspicion is key for early and acute diagnosis. Invasive management with a balloon angioplasty or stenting is highly effective in the acute setting, but the risk of recurrence is very, very high. Stenting significantly reduces the risk of PB least stenosis in comparison with balloon angioplasty. Despite these encouraging findings, least stenosis still occurs in more than one-fourth of those treated with a stent. 
There is a significant need for research into methods for improving outcomes for PV stenosis, including the use of new technologies such as a drug coated balloon or stand. When it comes to the aspect of the procedure itself, we have known for two obvious evidences for prevention of PV stenosis. One is do not ablate within the ostium of each PV. The second, as long as we can, if she lateral enteral ablation would be better than circumferential HPV ablation. However, we still don't know which, whether the single shot be, balloon based ablation is better than point by point catheter ablation. Which energy sources, including cryo, RF, laser, pulsed field, are better for prevention of PV stenosis? And is power, high power short duration is better than conventional RF ablation setting ablation? Still, we don't know yet. In terms of energy sources, there are two fundamental mechanisms for tissue necrosis. One is thermal ablation modality. The other is non-thermal ablation modality. Thermal ablation modalities include cryo, RF, and laser. The thermal ablation modality is pulsed field ablation. Traditional thermal ablation modalities such as RF and cryothermy rely on thermal extremes that are inherently indiscriminate in tissue destruction and then can develop collateral damages such as esophageal also or fistula and plane of paralysis. Pulsed field ablation selectively creates microscopic pores in cell membranes by delivering a positive electrical field to the target tissue. Cardiomyocytes appears to be particularly vulnerable to positive field ablation compared with other tissues, permitting preferential myocardial damage. Positive field ablation may avoid complications associated with thermal based ablation method. This interesting paper published in Heart Rhythm a few weeks ago four weeks ago, the assessed the PV narrowing in pulsed field ablation court group versus RF ablation court group. CT scan at three months after following a fib ablation was conducted in all enrolled population to measure PV OCL diameters after ablation. As you can see, quantitative as well as qualitative analysis was conducted in this patient, in this paper. Moderate and severe stenosis was found 3% in RF ablation group, whereas the, no one was found in pulsed field ablation. Mild stenosis was found in 11.4% in RF ablation group, whereas 0.8% in pulsed field ablation group. This is another interesting paper published in Circulation Journal 2018 to the assess the PV stenosis rate in RF ablation group versus cryoballoon ablation group versus laser balloon ablation group. If you look at the upper graphs, the risk of significant PV stenosis was very low irrespective of different energy sources. However, the incidence of mild pulmonary vein stenosis is highest in laser balloon ablation group and lowest in cryoballoon ablation group. When you see the low graph, LIPB is more vulnerable for cryoballoon ablation group and LSPB as well as LIPB was more vulnerable for laser balloon ablation group. Whereas RSPB follow, followed by LSPB was more vulnerable for RF ablation group. I think the shape or flexibility of balloon itself may be the main reason for more vulnerable for PB stenosis in laser or half balloon compared to the cryo balloon. If you look at the left figure, the contact area may be more inside of osteo, PB ostium in laser or half balloon compared to the cryo balloon. They may, I, I think that they may be more soft and deformable and squeezable than compared to the cryo balloon. But this is only possible explanation because I have no experience of laser or hot balloon ablation so far. As you know, the PB stenosis still occurs in cryo balloon ablation. 
the incidence of PB stenosis by cryoalloy ablation was approximately 3.1% using a first generation balloon, most of, most of which were treated by a 23 millimeter balloon. However, there is an unavoidable risk of PB stenosis even with a 28 millimeter second generation cryoalloy ablation. So far, we have done more than 350 cases of with a 28 millimeter second generation cryovalon ablation. There is only single, only one case with severe PB stenosis after ablation. The possible mechanism may be the bottom of LIPB osteum or the roof of LS, LSPB osteum could be lifted up or pulled down during cryovalon ablation in LSPB or LIPB, especially in common left PV with relatively smaller the osteum of less than 30 millimeter. The high pressure used to occlude the PV might have caused the PV stenosis in long common left PV. As you can see, long common left PV could be shrunk, looked like candy wrapper in patient with long common left PV with osteal diameter of less than 30 millimeter. As you know, there are the different PB anatomies of which left common PB is not uncommon. The, there are two types of left common PB. One is short common, the other is long common, as you, look and see, as you can see. If the osteal diameter of left common PB is more than, much more than 30 millimeter, cryovalon ablation could be done with the, the, safely because the, the space is between the cryo balloon, the osteum of the opposite PB is too wide. Therefore, cryo balloon ablation in this case is safely done. However, the osteal diameter of left common PB is 30 millimeter or less. The bottom of LI PB could be lifted up and the roof of LS PB could be pulled down when occluding, when freezing the opposite PB. Also, the long common PB could be shrunk, looked like a candy wrapper when you pushing, when you push the balloon too strong, too hard. These are typical example of intracardiac echocardiography while a 28 millimeter cryovalon ablation in normal PB anatomy. As you can clearly see, the 28 millimeter cryovalon was occluding in the LSPB here and LIPB here. You can clearly see the osteum of LIPB and LSPB here. The distance between the osteum and the cryoballon is very wide. However, if you look at the IC image, the measured diameter of osteal, measured osteal diameter was 26.5 millimeter here, and you can clearly see left common, long common PB looks like here. You can also measure, roughly measure by the eye using the achieved catheter because the diameter of achieved catheter is almost 20 millimeter. So this is a common left PB and the osteal diameter is less than 30 millimeter. The, as you know, the diameter of cryo balloon became become bigger when inflation of liquid nitrogen. So if you look at the IC image, the 28 millimeter cryo balloon do not, could not be entered into the osteal, osteum of the left common primary vein because the osteal diameter is almost less than 30 millimeter, 26.5 millimeters so far. In that case, do not push balloon too strong. Just contact is enough to isolate both problem veins simultaneously. Do not push too long, too hard. In this, eye, in this case, the measured the di osteal diameter was 29.8 millimeter. And you can clearly see the, the cryo balloon occluding the LI people here. And you can also clearly see the blood flow with red color from the LSPB. There is a narrow space between the balloon and the osteum of LSPB here.
But however, the when freezing, when freezing, the balloon is became bigger, and you cannot see any space between the osteum of LSPV and the balloon here. So the pulmonary vein stenosis could be developed in this case when you push the balloon too strong. The measured osteal diameter is 33.4 millimeter here. And you can clearly see the cryo balloon occluding LSPV here, occluding LIPV here. You can clearly see the blood flow with the red color from LIPV here and LSPV here. In that case, you don't worry about the PB stenosis at all. So let me conclude my presentation. Symptoms regarding PB stenosis developing during various periods, usually three to six months following AF ablation. The occurrence and severity of symptoms are related both to the degree of luminal narrowing and to the number of affected PVs. Identification of a slowly progressing PB stenosis in follow-up visit is challenging due to lower diagnostic yield of chest X-ray. Appropriate ablation technique for targeting the outside PB ostia is most important to prevent PB stenosis. We don't know yet whether or not the ablation strategy, including different RF setting, different energy sources, different techniques, influenced PB stenosis. Bigger balloon is not always better for prevention of PB stenosis, especially in common left PB with a relatively small osteal diameter. Whether the presence of common left PB osteum increases the risk of PB stenosis after single shot balloon ablation technique remains unclear. However, this possibility warrants consideration for further investigation. I am pretty confident the use of eyes during a ablation is very, very helpful to prevent PB stenosis. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Lin, for a very nice and elegant talk and update on pulmonary vein stenosis and occlusion. Uh, you, Dr. Like Keong, please release a uh, mute. Yeah, no, the... you can understand. Can you hear me now? Oh, no, we can hear. Okay, Please, uh, go sorry. ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Dr. Lin, thank you for a very nice talk on PV stenosis and occlusion. You have presented a lot of images and very good eyes images on common left pulmonary vein, a common off. Um, you explained how a balloon tactic with eyes could reduce the occurrence of PV stenosis. Um, do you find that with the common off on the left side, using balloon technology uh, needs more freezing and application of cryoblation? As you could see, there are flow you know, across various veins in those with large left pulmonary common off. Dr. Lin. Actually, I can hear you clearly, so I don't understand what you are asking, but uh, in common PVEs, usually the cryo balloon is safely done, but uh, in small LA, especially in the OCL diameter is less than 30 millimeter, we usually perform the segmental entry ovulation using the cryo balloon because we push the balloon against the PV, the PV stenosis could be developed. So in that case, especially in the low, the smaller LA, we usually perform the Entral ablation using the cryo balloon segmental ablation. All right. So in your segmental cryo ablation approach, does the ablation time significantly increase for such anatomy? No, no. It's the same. Actually, the ablation time is almost uh, forty minutes. So only the PBI isolation. But uh, the, when it comes to the the technical aspect, the PB isolation in the usually normal PB anatomy, the mean time is the, the same, 40 minutes. And in common PB, also the mean time is the 40 minutes. The procedure time is not affected in the common PB or, that, or not. A related question would be if would point by point radio frequency ablation for the less common off be a bit uh, a safer approach? compared to cryo ablation? Both safe. In my opinion, actually I have done more than 3,000 3, AFib ablation so far. So RF ablation is okay and cryo ablation is okay in common PB. You don't worry about that because the one thing you keep in mind, the don't push too hard 
in common PB. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Lim, I have a brief question. Yes. To avoid a PV stenosis, which technique is the best? So currently we have uh, four techniques, prior aberrations, hot barrel aberration, laser aberration, and conventional RF aberrations. Which technique is the best? I don't oh. care the cost. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I actually, actually, I don't care. The, I don't care because the cryo ablation is, is safely done in common left PB. So RF is good and cryo ablation good. But I have actually, unfortunately, I have no experience of laser or hot balloon ablation so far. But the cryo ablation is safely done in common left PB. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh. All right, uh, thank you so much for your good answers and sharing of tips and tricks in performing safe ablation for AFib. I'm afraid uh, the time has come to call this session to an end. You've been attending the APSC JCS 2002 webinar for New Horizon in Arrhythmia. I want to thank my co-chair and all the speakers for their wonderful talks that give us an update to the current technology in treating Arrhythmias in patients uh, with heart diseases. Thank you so much, and I wish you a good evening. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>